So we're back again today to talk a little bit about common rail diesel systems, specifically no start basics, focusing on the fuel systems. You know, a lot of people are scared of diesels. They're not familiar with them. They think they are way more complex than they really are. And I just want to show you guys that it's really not as complex as it seems it is. Now, I grew up working on automotive i kicked over into diesel became caterpillar certified and bounced back into automotive but I, i've done worked for john deere for years doing diesel still work on diesel trucks almost every day be it a uh, light duty medium duty up to heavy duty trucks and at the end of the day it's really no worse than any other system out there in fact there's a lot of systems on automobiles a lot of evap systems even that I dislike a lot more than working on a diesel as tight as they may be in their engine compartments in the modern day, as high pressure as they may be, as many special tools as you may need. At the end of the day, they're built on some basic principles of operation and they're really not terrible to work on. So let's kick over to the slideshow here. And let's look at some of the basic diesel fuel system layouts we've had over the years. Anybody who's played with diesels on and off over the years is going to be familiar with these. For those of you who have been strictly gasoline based, this may be a little new. Keep in mind, we are going to focus this series on common rail diesels, but it's still good to know where everything came from. So... Diesels have had direct injection in one form or another since approximately the early to mid 1950s. Now, that's not to say that every diesel manufactured since then has had direct injection. A lot of you may be familiar with the 69 IDI and the 73 IDI that Ford ran in the late 80s and early 90s before switching over to the 73 IDI. They were indirect injected diesels. But in one form or another, direct injection has been fairly commonly in use between light, medium, and heavy-duty diesels since about the 1950s. So it's not exactly the newest technology. Now, we achieved this injection a few different ways. Some of the earliest systems were PLN systems, pump, line, nozzle. You would have your mechanical injection pump your steel lines, which would then go to literally a nozzle, not an injector. In a lot of ways, you can consider the pump, line, and nozzle as your entire injector. If you were to build that in the modern day, all that would be compressed into one injection unit, whereas the PLN systems, your individual cylinder injection was controlled within the injection pump itself, sent through the hard line, to the nozzle, which was basically just a spring panel. Once enough diesel fuel pressure was built up, it would on-seat the nozzle seat, allow fuel injection, and then would shut once fuel pressure dropped down enough. Then we went to various forms of unit injection, mechanical unit injection, be that a rocker arm hitting it, or there were a couple different variants, but generally you would have an injector that has its own little plunger with a fuel rail running through and a rocker arm would hit the top of that plunger and inject it the same way it would operate an intake or an exhaust valve at a set time that really didn't leave a lot of flexibility for certain power demands certain idle capabilities variance and load usage and a lot of other things there was electronic unit injection injection which used an electronic solenoid to help basically build off of that mechanical unit injection system. Then you have Huey, which a lot of people are familiar with, hydraulic electric unit injection. The 7.3 power strokes, the 6.0 power strokes, which were actually international engines. Um, some Mac Volvo engines. There, there's countless over the years that have used some variation of the Huey system, which basically uses a fuel rail to feed each individual injector and a high pressure oil system in order to actuate the plunger. Now they still have an electronic solenoid to get everything to work, but that's where everything basically built up into these common rail systems, a lot of which are using 
piezoelectric injectors, in which case now you just have a common fuel rail at a very high pressure and everything is controlled within the injector itself via a PCM, ECM, a control unit of some type. So common rail, just like direct injection, is not a new concept. There were, uh, in research, I found references, patents, and various iterations from the early 1920s onwards. So not that long after Rudolf Diesel came out with his iteration of the diesel engine, they have been playing with common rail systems of some way, shape, or form. Once again, the technology, the capabilities were not there. So what we have here is a very basic generic layout of a high pressure common rail system. So we're gonna have our low pressure fuel supply, which to me is gonna start at the tank and you're gonna have two main tank setups. You're gonna have a pressurized setup, in which case you're using a conventional electronic fuel pump. These are world we like to call these lift pumps but we're gonna start with this electronic fuel pump, which is going to suck from the bottom of the tank, and it's gonna pressurize into your primary fuel filter, pass it through the fuel filter, and up into your high pressure fuel pump. Now you'll also see here, we're gonna have, all this yellow is gonna be our low pressure fuel system. So we're gonna have some slippage or leak by within this high pressure fuel pump. That's because the fuel is being used to cool and lubricate the internal components here. Uh, very much same thing you'd see in hydraulic pumps and hydraulic motors. It's called controlled slip. Now this is just like a hydro hydraulic system because that's really all it is. It is a hydraulic system. There is the capability for excessive wear in this pump to then cause excessive leak by which will then lower your low pressure fuel supply, thus making it harder for the high pressure fuel system to build up to where it needs to be. It's no different than an engine losing compression as the rings and the cylinder walls wear. So you'll also have that, and then you'll have controlled slippage all the way down to there. That's gonna go through your return on your pressure control valve, and you're gonna have some that goes back through, bypasses through the filter, back into the tank. We have our filters. Some systems only use a primary filter, which likely at that point will have a fuel water separator at the bottom. Diesel fuel will sit on top of water, so the concept is with this fuel water separator, any water will go to the bottom of the filter and you'll have this little screw right down here that will allow you to drain the water. Most modern systems also have a water and fuel sensor that will let you know when water is sensed in here to keep you up to date and let you know you got to drain it. Honestly, you need to be draining it long before that light ever comes on with these common rail systems. But as a last ditch, that light is there and it will let you know that there is water contained in it. Uh, this particular system we're outlining here does have a pre-filter on the electric pump. And so it's technically a primary filter or a pre-filter and your secondary fuel filter or fuel water separator. And you may even have a secondary fuel filter. This will be higher micron, eight to 10 micron. If you had another fuel filter in there, um, you would likely be somewhere in the neighborhood of four to eight microns, depending on the manufacturer. And we will talk about filtration and its role in no starts shortly. The second style of these low pressure fuel systems is actually going to be instead of having a pressure set up here, you're going to have a lift pump mounted either on the frame rail in a primary fuel filter housing or even all the way up at the back of the injection pump. So say we had our primary fuel filter here, and then we actually had a setup with a lift pump or a suction pump built right onto that fuel filter housing. That means everything down or downstream of it would be under suction. 
that means it is very, very, very prone to air leaks. If we do, don't, do not have tight connections, if we've got a pickup tube with maybe a, a hole in it, something else, loose clamps, that air will get sucked in on that side and will cause us low pressure fuel supply issues, which then gives us a hard time building up high pressure fuel. If you don't have your base, if you don't have your low pressure, you can't build your high pressure. Uh, Duramax would be one that comes to mind where they actually measure, instead of fuel pressure on the low pressure side, they measure fuel vacuum or uh, supply restriction. So we've got that. Then we go to our high pressure fuel supply system. And right here, this is our high pressure pump. So we've got our low pressure feeding in. Depending on the system, you'll have what's called a volume control valve right in this section, which controls the total volume of fuel allowed into this pump. Basically, it only supplies as much fuel volume as you need to maintain ideal operating conditions given any particular load, speed, acceleration demands you currently have. From our high pressure pump, we're gonna to go to our fuel rail. So our fuel rail, we're gonna go out of the outlet of the pump and we're gonna go into our fuel rail. And this is where the common rail name comes from. It is one common fuel rail with little threaded nipples here that feed individual injectors. A lot of systems you'll actually see have built in dampeners off of these common rail nipples. So it basically to help ease the fluctuation of pressure within the system, uh, water hammering, if you guys are familiar with the concept, when you have rapid pressure changes, rapid release and build up of pressure, you'll get a hammering, you'll get a noise. Uh, similar to if you have high pressure water at your house, you shut the spigot off real fast, you get that little jack hammering back through the water pipes. Same concept, so you'll actually have a small flow dampener or pulsation dampener built into these rails. Generally, I've never seen them cause a no start issue nor a drivability issue really, but there is a first time for everything. And then we've got our fuel delivery, which to me would be anything from the rail itself, our hard line here down to our injector. And obviously our injectors are gonna be electronically controlled by our control unit. And that's gonna take input from APP, engine uh, position sensors, be it our cam and crank, as well as other sensors that give us load, uh, torque demand, there's boost, ambient air temperature, intake air temperature sensor. There, there's a lot that goes into making sure these diesels run at optimal performance, optimal speed, and the lowest emissions possible. You're gonna have a pressure sensor because you need some way for the system to monitor what the pressure is in the rail. Once again, goes back to the ECU that feeds in to our volume control valve here or suction control valve. Different names, same concept. And then our rail pressure that will feed back to our pressure control valve so we can control volume and we can control pressure. There are times when we want higher pressure but need lower volume. There are times when we need higher volume but lower pressure. So these two would work in conjunction with each other and one of our main feedbacks on that is our rail pressure sensor. And these are commonalities throughout pretty much every common rail diesel system out there. They may have different names, they may have different locations in the system, but the general core architecture of the common rail system remains the same. There is only so many ways to do any given task. So we're going over the 85% and allowing you on a case by case basis to learn the 15% of how a particular manufacturer does it. So our pressure control, like we said, that would be our pressure control valve here, which opens and closes based off of desired pressure within the rail. 
and we're going to have a relief valve. Now that relief valve may be located in the end of the rail, may be located in the pump, may be located as part of this pressure control valve setup, but that relief valve is not meant to be popped off. Pretty much every manufacturer out there gives you a set life cycle. In fact, I remember with John Deere, um, John Deere, we actually had, and I'm, I'm going to be a little wrong here. It was between three to five pop-offs you're allowed before that high pressure relief valve is done and you need to put a new one in to the point where you would actually reset the number of times it had popped off that high pressure relief valve after replacing the component. Now, that is important, that valve there, because we'll say a generic system, we're going to run max pressure 27,000 PSI, right? We don't want to go above 27,000 PSI. We could run into injector back pressure issues. We could run into pipes bursting, a lot of different issues. So that relief valve is a final ditch effort where if our pressure control valve fails in one way, if our pump or our volume control valve sticks wide open, rail pressure sensors lie in, and so the pump just keeps building, 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 that relief valve is going to save the system from catastrophic damage. It is a mechanical relief valve. It is a spring that is set to a preset pressure. Now, they can fail closed. Not a big deal. A lot of aftermarket people will be familiar with dummy plugs, which run into just such that situation where you intentionally block off that relief valve in order to maintain higher rail pressures for increased performance, depending on what you're doing. That's generally not a problem. The problem is when that relief valve fails open or sticks open due to sediment, debris, contamination within the fuel system. So general operation, we basically went through this already, but fuel is pulled from the tank, be it through a suction tube that runs to a lift pump further down the line or from a conventional in-tank fuel pump setup. It's pulled either way and then it's pressurized, run through a secondary filter of some type, fuel water separator, regular fuel filter, depends on the system, depends on the overall end usage. From there, after being filtered, it's fed to a high pressure pump. And this pump achieves the desired rail pressure for starting, running, towing, whatever it may be, based on a combination of using the low pressure supply, controlling the suction or volume through a suction control or a volume control valve, and a pressure control valve within the rail. And there, once again, the fuel rail pressure sensor would be one of the sensors that it inputs along with all the others in order to maintain the perfect combination of duty cycles for all these to obtain our desired results. Common rail fuel is fed through this high pressure fuel pump. The injectors are controlled via an ECU, ensure optimal engine performance throughout various loads and speeds. We're gonna run our injectors at one pressure, one volume, one strategy for a cold start. As it warms up, we're gonna run them a different way at idle. If we go for a wide open throttle run, we're gonna be controlling volume and pressure differently, as well as injection timing, than if we're doing a slow acceleration with a heavy load or a full throttle run with a heavy load. So everything's constantly changing and these sensors allow sensors and valves allow us to have everything operating optimally to give us the most power, most performance, most reliability with the least amount of emissions possible. So commonalities throughout the systems. What are our starting essentials for any, any vehicle really, but in this case, common rail diesels? First is batteries. Batteries, 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 batteries. Especially if you're in colder climates. First thing you do, battery voltage, it's overall state of charge, overall quality, appearance, tightness, everything of the connections. 
without good batteries. There's a reason diesels require two batteries minimum. And without these good batteries, we can achieve proper injector firing. We can achieve proper cranking speeds. We can't achieve proper voltage to the ECUs located throughout the vehicle that all need to communicate in order to get this to start. So without proper battery voltage and good connections, you're dead in the water. So batteries first. If they are marginal, especially if you're in northern, further northern climates where it gets cold, if they're marginal, something, you know, maybe down California, New Mexico, Texas, that you may say, hey, they've got another year or two in it. If you're further north, if it's marginal like that, 60, 70 percent state of charge. I'm, I'm looking at honestly, if it's a winter time or a cold weather crank, no start complaint. I'm looking at replacing those batteries if I can't bring them back up with a solid charge. Air filtration and flow. So one of the things you may see on certain things is excessive back pressure. A lot of times there's data page you can look at within your scan data to be able to see what your back pressure is. Seize turbos would be a common thing, especially with VGT setups, where the veins can actually seize all the way closed, essentially building up too much back pressure, creating a very hard start at times. With turbocharged engines and diesel engines in general, yes, you can have a hard start with too much airflow, but almost 99.9% .9 of the time, you're really looking at a restriction of air, be it from turbo vanes being too closed, uh, an intercooler being clogged up, an air filter being sucked completely shut due to too much debris from lack of maintenance, certain ports and certain diesel engine des designs, too much carbon buildup, uh, collapsed tubes can all cause a hard start due to lack of airflow. But once again, we're going to be focusing mainly on the fuel systems. We kind of want to attack this one symptom at a time or one system at a time, rather. Oil level and quality is still incredibly important, just as it's always been. Uh, those of you familiar with Huey systems know down to the point that even if you don't have the proper grade of oil, you can have over aeration of the oil, which leads to all sorts of performance issues. And... These engines are running at very tight tolerances. So we want to make sure that oil level is correct. We don't want too much to where we're pushing oil into systems we don't need them in, but we don't want too little to where we're lacking lubrication, overheating the engine, and then creating cascade effect of failures elsewhere because all that heat and the debris buildup from a lack of lubrication and lack of cooling from the correct oil level can cause catastrophic failure throughout the rest of the system. We also want to make sure we don't have fuel dilution or excessive fuel dilution. Uh, most manufacturers give you an allowable amount of fuel dilution within the oil per a given oil change interval, a given mileage interval. So we want to we want to have a general idea that if we're three to four quarts over full, is that OK or is that a sign of poor combustion due to a mechanical failure or um, a leaking down injector? If we have an injector and a common rail system leaking down. That entire rail is all common, so that's one pressure that is fed to all of the injectors. If we have one injector, let alone two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, that are leaking at varying rates, be it a lot or a little, it's gonna be that much harder to build pressure and eventually that leak will overcome the capability of the engine management system to overcome it and you will have a no crank, no start. Generally, you'll have performance issues before that but if you don't realize that, the customer doesn't realize that, eventually the ultimate symptom will be a crank no start, which might have been caught sooner. Fuel supply and pressure. Tank level. Sounds stupid. Double check the tank level. Do a gauge sweep, key on, key off, regular instrument cluster sweep, something. Get yourself a decent idea how much fuel's in it. 
even if you got to ask the customer, hey, have you recently filled this up? Where did you fill it up? It's a good time to talk to them, actually. Hey, um, how long have you been experiencing this? Was this a long term, hard to start, and eventually it, it built into a crank no start? Or recently after getting fu fueled, did it become a crank no start? It gives you a good idea of when they last filled the tank, which is a plausibility check against the overall electronic reading on the gauge, as well as the quality and the time period in which that tank was filled, that gives you a good starting direction. Fuel water separator, you'll see a lot in medium and heavy duty trucks that you'll actually have a visible sediment bowl at the bottom of the fuel water separator that'll allow you to see debris as well as water. And it, it takes two seconds for almost every system, even if you gotta crawl under the truck, like the Fords with the HFCMs, and you just, just spin that fuel water separator plug out see what comes out of there. Is it water coming out? Is it clean diesel? Do you have water and red diesel and some rust and debris? And, you know, it's important. Fuel filter condition. And anything with a metal carcass filter is actually really good to check for this. Look for signs of rust. If you have water or other contaminants sitting in that fuel system, it'll actually start to rust out that metal carcass of the fuel filter. You'll see it a lot on the Duramaxes that have the fuel water separator mounted up on the passenger side. Can't quite see it from the top. You can just see the, uh, the primer plunger. Can't quite see it from the bottom. If you don't know it's there, you'll probably never change it. A lot of uh, DIY guys don't realize they're there, don't do their research. A lot of shops who don't specialize or do a lot of diesel who are just doing routine maintenance may not be aware it's there. And I've seen a lot of them, they build up that water in there and because it is a metal carcass, it actually starts to rot it. And generally you'll get intermittent misfires, loss of power, aeration of the fuel, but ultimately it will collapse, fail to the point where you can't build pressure, you're sucking nothing but air, and you'll have a crank no start condition. Easy way to check that one, pump that primer up, and you'll see fuel spewing out of it nine times out of 10 if it's been compromised that far. But these are all just quick visual checks you can do while you're, while you're there. Uh, like I said, the HFCM, a lot of people don't realize they're underneath there. Spin that plug out, see what you got. Sediment bowl we discussed. So your initial observations. Like I've been harping on, visual inspection. Overall condition of the vehicle. Batteries. Fluid levels and qualities. Filter conditions. Do they look like they've been on there forever? Are they OE filters? Are they aftermarket filters? Look at that fuel tank and the filler neck condition. Is the filler neck all rusty? and corroded, a good sign that there has been a lot of water or other debris coming in with the fuel system or fuel source they're using. Are there signs of DEF on that fuel tank? You know, uh, the Fords. I know GM moved their uh, DEF tanks up under the hood, but the Fords, you've got your urea fill right next to the, your fuel fill, and it would not be the first time, even with a longtime owner of one of these trucks where fluids were put in the wrong port. So look for signs like that. These, these are quick visual indications that can give you a lot of info and help your direction progress one way or the other and get you through a successful diag faster. Look for fuel leaks, oil leaks, uh, signs of soot leaks, which could give you indications of why this vehicle is hard to start or won't start. Uh, I, I have rubs and damage here. Don't go crazy with it. We're doing a visual inspection here. We don't need to dissect the entire vehicle. We just need to know what we're looking at and notate it. Look for missing components. Anybody dealing with diesels, especially these later model common rail diesels, knows there is a lot of performance components. There's a lot of emissions deletes out there, which are not road legal, but... It is what it is. You deal with it as you need to, given your area and the legality of it. But 
sometimes these missing components, if we've been in there playing around, we're going to be able to go through and basically say, hey, while this was being modified, this happened, or this, or this will have a backwards effect on that. Just something to keep in mind and to look for. And generally, how I do it is I walk up to a vehicle, I do a quick four-corner inspection, get a general idea of its operating conditions. Is it, is it a, a pavement princess? Beautifully waxed, polished, not a stone chip anywhere, nice and clean, never had a trailer on it. Or is it a quarry truck that's got the bedside caved in, it's got a plow mount on the front, it's got five years worth of dirt, mud, and oil leaks all caked up underneath it. Those give us two good starting pictures of what kind of overall condition that vehicle is going to be in. Now, you can have pavement princesses that have never been maintained properly, and you can have quarry trucks that are beat to crap that have had all their filters and fluids changed religiously and correctly. So don't let it throw you too far in one direction or the other. Just notate it and keep it in your mind as a possible clue. While I'm doing all this, though, I'm performing a full system scan. I've already got my scanner hooked up with my breakout box, depending on which scanner I'm using. That way I can see battery voltage, key on engine off, get a good idea for a base state of charge. And depending on the system, sometimes it takes a minute to perform a full system code scan. Sometimes it can take four or five minutes. So I just click full system scan and I go about my business doing my visual inspection. By the time I'm done that, I'm ready to go through whatever data the computer has collected and saved on what it thinks the issue is. From there, after notating our initial code scan and seeing uh, freeze frame data is, is great sometimes for this. Did we start off with, you know, we have freeze frame data for injector misfires that have been going on for thousands of miles, and now we have a crank no start. Well, if I've had misfire codes for a while, and now I'm finally not starting at all, would I be more prone to looking into rail pressure and injector operation at this point? Would I be looking closer at that over full oil level due to fuel dilution? Knowing that it had misfire issues, now I can't build rail pressure. I've got too much diesel fuel within my oil per spec. You know, with little to no work, we're, we're already narrowing down our funnel in a good direction one way or the other. Then we want to look at our preliminary key on engine off data. Same thing you would do for pretty much anything out there. Temperature sensor plausibility checks. Pressure sensor reading plausibility checks. We want to make sure uh, fuel rail pressure sensor and low side pressure and restriction center sensors. We want to make sure the data we're reading makes sense for a key on engine off, preferably engine cold. But, you know, as you get to know these more, you can do it with a hot engine. But we want to see that it makes sense. Is our ECT reading close to ambient temperature? Is our intake air temperature sensor reading the same? Uh, if we've got ECT at negative 40, we're going to be dumping a lot of fuel. Even though it's 50 degrees outside, we're going to be dumping a lot of fuel. That's going to create an issue in and of itself. Same with our fuel rail pressure sensor. Is that reading zero key on engine off? If that's already reading 5, 600 PSI, the pump is only going to control itself through volume and pressure to achieve it's four, five, 6,000 PSI starting, correct? So if that sensor's already skewed 500 PSI high, we can, we'll say it's exponentially skewed throughout. It's not always a linear skew, but for all intents and purposes, let's say it is. The engine control system believes it is achieving the pressure it needs to start, but it won't start. It won't throw a code for that either, but we won't be able to start because we're not actually achieving that desired pressure. That's why these plausibility checks are so important before we do anything else. It can give you a lot of good direction. And then, especially because a lot of times you're going to need to 
at least bump the key to check your low pressure fuel system get that uh that lift pump running some will cycle on as soon as you cycle the key on for 15 30 seconds sometimes up to two minutes others requires a bump of the key to initiate that lift pump running that allows us to check key on engine off low pressure fuel supply if we have a data pad for it after that we can go to our cranking cadence with that cranking cadence we want a nice smooth even cranking at this point we're also capturing data on our low pressure side our high pressure side our volume and pressure control solenoids we're basically recording all this while we're cranking so we can hear audibly how it sounds and we can review the data to see how the system's reacting to what it perceives is going on now if you hear a missing cylinder or a real uneven unsteady cranking cadence and you're not getting smoke out the tailpipe showing that you know injectors are firing out of time something like that At that point you're stepping away from fuel system at least initially and probably going to perform a relative compression test be that with ids or with the texa tool or whatever you may have a lot of these diesels now support relative compression tests with both factory and aftermarket tooling. So supply side fuel, we have in tank or frame mounted lift pumps. Generally data pids are available. Like I said, we're being real generic here. We're just going over an overall system operation. Times you have a lift pump integral to the high pressure pump, in which case anything below that is all under suction. Once again, prone to aeration of the fuel. If we have aerated fuel, we can't build that high pressure. So that's something to keep in mind. If it's a in-tank pump, we're going to treat that low pressure supply diagnosis differently than if it is a suction style system. Um, a lot of manufacturers do give you a low pressure fuel spec. Others like a Duramax, Isuzu, Caterpillar, depending on year make model, um, give you a vacuum spec now duramax most of the duramaxes are between five to seven inches of vacuum is your maximum allowable spec while cranking idle spec slightly different it's a uh, basically a supply restriction test is what you're doing more so than a supply pressure test and that's just due to the design of the system a lot of times you will have filter restriction switches in there, which will give you before you even have to pop the hood or pull a manual gauge out to hook up to these systems. You'll have filter restriction switches that will trip or give you an actual pressure or vacuum reading in order to direct your diagnosis one way or the other. So fuel filtration. So what we've got here is one of many aftermarket setups where you can add additional fuel filtration and in this case additional fuel pump and additional lift pump or you're replacing the factory fuel filtration and factory lift pump in hopes of getting better longevity out of the system better performance regardless of what's on there always 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 if you have a diesel coming in for pretty much anything interrogate the customer on their fuel filter service history if they hesitate and they're not really sure assume it hasn't ever been done or hasn't been done in a very long time and basically be ready that one of the first steps you're going to be doing is replacing the fuel filtration oem fuel filters um, i'm talking everything from light duty medium duty heavy duty off-road generally the primary filters eight to 10 to 12 microns i've seen up to 14 to 16 on earlier common rail systems for a primary your first run fuel filter i've seen four to eight on your secondary fuel filters once again depending on the system and the layout the reason they go with larger microns is essentially <clears throat> to allow longer service intervals between filter changes it's a way to keep customers happy it does risk allowing smaller debris through, which a lot of people in the aftermarket believes contributes to injection pump and injector failure earlier. 
And they're not entirely wrong, which is why aftermarket filtration systems either add to or bypass the OEM filtration. And almost every single one out there filters to a smaller micron level. That's good. You're catching a lot of debris and all, but it has its own inherent issues as well. Number one, the more you filter, the more often you need to replace the filters. Because you're catching more of that debris from the fuel system, they are going to plug up faster and you're going to need to replace them more frequently. Unfortunately, a lot of people buy these aftermarket filtration systems thinking that not only does it filter better, but it filters longer. And that's not really the case. That's not how filtration works. And when you run a smaller micron filter and you're catching more of that, as it clogs up faster, you restrict that fuel flow. Now you're starving the rest of the system for that fuel that it needs to run to cool and to lubricate. And in essence, you're creating damage at the same or a higher level than if you were using OEM filtration and maintaining them at the correct intervals. You also have the issue that depending on how the fuel system is designed and the overall health of the vehicle when you install this aftermarket filtration, you can actually have, <coughs> excuse me, you can actually have too much restriction on the supply side. Essentially, the microns are so small that the system design is having trouble pulling the adequate um, volume of fuel through them, and you can essentially be generating self-made fuel system issues all the way up to a no start condition. From our low side, we then build up to our high side, right? We've got our volume control valve, which will control the volume of fuel being allowed into our high pressure fuel pump. Uh, you may also hear, depending on the manufacturer, it called a suction control valve. One way I've heard it described, which I really like, is it's a throttle valve for the pump. It's, it's no different than a throttle butterfly in an automotive setup. It opens or closes as needed to allow more or less fuel into that pump, depending on what its needs are. Now, these can be normally open or normally closed. A normally open volume control valve would have a duty cycle of 0% for fuel full flow. So if we were watching a data pid while cranking and we saw that volume control was all the way at 0% and it's still not building pressure, we know we're going one direction. A normally closed would have a duty cycle of 100% for fuel flow, full flow of fuel. And once again, we would watch these data pids in conjunction with our pressure control valve. And once again, they work hand in hand. It's also gonna be normally open or normally closed depending on system design and same duty cycles. So we wanna see, essentially there's an inverse relation within reason. As pressure increases, flow generally decreases. So as flow decreases, we wanna increase volume to help accommodate for that, depending on what our overall concerns are. There are times when we went high, full, high fuel volume and low fuel pressure and vice versa. There are times when we want high volume and high pressure. Depends on the given operating needs at any given point. And then we have our overflow valve, our pressure relief valve, our cascade valve. This is the mechanical valve we discussed earlier that pops off once the system achieves overpressure. It has gone above and beyond what it was designed to, and it pops off this mechanical valve, allowing excess fuel to dump to the tank. So the duty cycles here are good. Um, they really are. It, it's nice if you understand the system. Now, a lot of people will tell you do the unplug it test. You unplug it, and if you can't build any pressure unplugged, right, then we would have a normally closed system. If it builds max pressure or max volume unplugged, we would have a normally open system. Problem is, you got to know what a known good acts like, as well as the fact that not every 
pressure control or volume control valve is easy to get to to unplug it. And you can still have a stuck one way or the other valve. So the unplug it test or the duty cycle is not always 100% accurate unless you know the system you're working on. It's just something to keep in mind. Now, overflow valves, these cascade valves, generally they have within a very short distance of them, they have a rubberized return line that is normally pretty easy to pull off. And you can see if you've got fuel flowing out of there, no good. You want that thing dry as a bone because it really should not be popping off ever. And so that is a quick, easy check to do if you're at the point where it's cranking normally, supply voltage is good, fluid levels are good, and your low pressure side's good, but you're just not building that high pressure side. There's a very high likelihood if you have even a little bit of diesel fuel in that relief valve, that that's where your pressure is dumping to. So once again, system design, analyzing the system based off of overall design and the symptoms, putting them together. So just uh, in case people aren't super familiar with how these are set up. So right here, we've got a CP4 pump. You've got its little internal cam and that's gonna actuate this plunger, which is gonna pump fuel out to the rail. You're gonna have your supply right here. And right in here is gonna be what would be considered your volume control valve. Now that valve, in this case, this would be a normally closed valve because if we look at it, uh, well, I, I don't see a spring here, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna call it normally closed. So normally, if this were unplugged, this valve would close, blocking off the supply port here, right? That would mean we could build all the low pressure fuel in the world down here, but it's just sitting there and it's deadheading. Can't get into the pump, we build no pressure. So we would wanna see that duty cycle. If it was normally closed, we wanna, would wanna see the duty cycle increase, which would draw this back further, allowing various amounts of fuel in, which then goes to our pumping chamber, which is then sent out to the common rail. Also, some of it will be used for slippage to cool and lubricate the pump. So really it's, uh, I mean, it's nothing crazy. <clears throat> it's a basically normally open, normally closed solenoid. So let's look at this system real quick. Same diagram we looked at before, but now we got to think when we're diagnosing, we got to have at least a, a basic understanding. We could have suction or pressure up to the filter. So we need to know enough of system design to know that on the particular vehicle we're looking at. We need to know what, how many filters are on there. And we want to be looking at data pads. If I've got a restriction indicator right here that's awesome especially if i've got a fuel pump mounted in this fuel filter here right so if i've got a fuel pump mounted here and a restriction indicator here a sensor or pressure switch of some type cool i i know right off the bat if that if that pops off if it says i'm restricted or i've got high vacuum i'm going right back in this little section of the system <coughs> Now, what if that was that pressure or restriction sensor was mounted here? Well, now we're looking at the fact that the higher likelihood would be our filter would be clogged, correct? And that's that's basically what we're looking at. We have the same core components throughout almost every common rail diesel system. But where these components are marked at or located at rather affects how we use them for diagnostic purposes and how we break down the system to use the info we're gathering from the driver's seat to be able to best inform our diagnostic direction. Because for those of you who have seen these worked on or have had the pleasure or displeasure of working on them, they're not the easiest things in the world to go ripping and tearing and doing a lot of testing on. 
there's certain things you can do fairly easily, but let's be honest. How many of you have a mechanical or even a, a WPS, something like that, uh, gauge that you're going to plumb in and measure fuel rail pressure at 28,000, 30, 28, 30,000 PSI? Not to mention the fact that almost every manufacturer at this point has gone to the point where their high pressure injection lines are one time use only. Because of the pressures and the fact that most are torqued to yield, you can't go cracking injection lines. You can't go removing stuff left and right willy nilly without racking up a large bill. So you need to be very sure about where you're going in your diagnostic direction, your diagnostic path to make sure you're getting the most value from the info you have at hand, from the testing you're capable of doing without costing both the shop a lot of time and money in parts, as well as the customer a lot of time and money that may not be needed if you had a more directed diagnostic approach. So that's um, that's just part one of everything. It's, it, it's a class I'm going to be working through. It, it's fairly involved. I just wanted to run through a rough draft basic systems operation and build out from there because there's so much that's going on there's so many changes in common rail diesels even from year to year within the same engine and so it, it's almost impossible to cover everything in one class but we will build on each section and hopefully get a little deeper into it I just wanted to show people who may not be familiar with diesels or are scared of working on them that they're not overly complex. There's a lot going on, especially once you get to the after treatment systems. But if you chunk everything down into systems, into your low pressure, your supply side, and then chunk that after you've confirmed supply side, chunk that into high pressure supply. From there, chunk it into rail supply or control, even down to injector or sensor inputs and ECU outputs. If you chunk everything into digestible sections based off of the symptoms you're experiencing and the data you're acquiring, it is not nearly as intimidating as if you go into it blind and just start testing willy nilly. So I hope you guys enjoy that. And hope to guys to see everybody soon in another video covering this or something else. I've got a lot of different stuff going. Um, so I don't know what's going to come out next. I don't know when it's going to come out next. Everything changes from day to day based off of workload at the shop and personal and everything else. So until the next time, everybody have a good night.